The Ten Commandments, Part 6. Hi, welcome back to church here as we are going through the Ten Commandments uh, in, in the series on the Ten Commandments. We're in the sixth week, which is the sixth commandment, doing one per week. And it is Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Now you might think, well, that's a pretty easy one to do because there's not too many murderers out there. And that's an easy command to follow. However, I'm going to get more into the intricacies of this and what is the ethical standard that Jesus, when he raised the bar, when he taught on this. So really this series has, has been a lot of the Ten Commandments according to Jesus. And how has he uh, changed it or any of these? And how has he expounded upon them to expect more from us? And he did so based upon relationship. Each of these you'll notice if you've been following our series, it's a purpose for it, not just a do's and don'ts list. It's meant to have a productive uh, life for all of us. And there's a lot that we can learn here today, even if we don't murder. But there's th thoughts and actions in our life that put us on uh, that bent of thought. And we wanna make sure that we are uh, protected from that and that we actually become productive, not just not murdering, but to in instead to bring life. Because that's really what the, the, the tragic part about murder is, is that God created life, and then that's the unlawful taking of somebody's life. Now, murder, according to the Old Testament, uh, had a lot of caveats to it, so it was a much more expounded upon law, just like all the others, as I've mentioned, where the Ten Commandments really represent just one kind of section, and then there's a subsection, which is the rest of the law, which those 600 laws are kind of like an overflow of the Ten Commandments. So what did it mean to murder uh, according to the Old Testament? And then we'll bring it to the New Testament. Well, it's the unauthorized or unlawful taking of life. It's not just killing, it's the unlawful way of doing so. And in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 35, God gives some reasons to which the government uh, can and do so uh, to, to do in order to execute somebody uh, for capital punishment. And that was basically, if you murdered, the Old Testament considered that you forfeited your life. So somebody's not killing you in return. It's that you forfeited your life. You took their life. It's kind of like the eye for an eye sort of thing. But that is what is proper. And so it being unlawful is a part of it. So there is some Old Testament laws, we'll get to the new in just a moment, that allowed for that, uh, for the, the government to be able to lawfully execute somebody. And the standards were quite high. There needed to be witnesses and there needed to be a safe and fair trial. Uh, and even so much so, that's why refuge cities were built when God sent them into the promised land. He said, I want you to build cities of refuge so the people that are accused of a crime can go there and nothing will happen to them until their day in court is had. And so that's a really important right that we still talk about here today is that you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, this is the bedrock of all law and order that is, starts with the Ten Commandments and has effects on us even here today. And so with that, you could not murder for stealing. You could not kill somebody. There was no law that allowed it for something trivial like that. It was always a capital offense. Now, it is also the premeditated. So murder breaks into two kind of uh, uh, scenarios. One where, uh, you know, it might be a mistake. You're, you're doing something careless and you kill somebody. And another might be that you just have evil in your heart and then you go and kill somebody. So the premeditated murder is obviously the worst. Here we call that uh, first degree murder. But then there's also things that we call uh, manslaughter. So for example, in Numbers 35, it does say if a man strikes another man with his fist and so that man dies, even though he didn't intend him to, he is a murderer. And that's how they do So if we are doing something that is wrong and that careless behavior, that evil behavior, results in a, a, someone dying, because even though we didn't intend to, uh, that is considered murder in the Old Testament. And the person was held accountable for that. And even if you were mischievous, like lighting a fire and somebody ended up, her house caught on fire and then they died. So that, that total complete disregard for human life um, that results in a death is considered murder in the Old Testament. And something you have to understand about the culture to which this is in, and it's, it's kind of like the Wild West. You know, it's like there are more people than there are people to enforce things. And, uh, and people dealt with things on their own. You know, the, the ancient world was much different than what ours is uh, today. Even for example, that they didn't have penitentiaries. And uh, they would have some dungeons to be able to hold people, usually just while they're waiting for trial if it was a major crime. But mostly, um, people were not, uh, were not held uh, in prison sentences like we have now. You were either freed, fined, flogged, or you were finished. That is the way they dealt with it. If you were guilty, uh, then they'd find, well, uh, is this a, a punishable by flogging? Is it punishable by uh, uh, fine or even being sold into slavery? Or is this something that's a capital offense? And so, because they didn't have the money uh, in the ancient society to, in order to, to hold people just in that, uh, in that way of thinking. And so because of that, verdicts were generally pretty quick. And we talk about the Wild West where people dealt with things on their own. 
the, the Old Testament law is also saying don't do that. Don't just because you can take out your neighbor who has done something to you. Don't do that. And this is not the Wild West. It was the Middle East. And, and so for us to understand, wrapping our head uh, around that, is that uh, there's a lot of vigilantism in the sense of like that people thought they could do things themselves. In the Ten Commandments, even though it sounds brutal, that uh, if somebody murders somebody, that they can be uh, lawfully uh, terminated because of the, uh, of the government doing so, that we find that disconcerting because many of us are against capital punishment. But with this, this actually uh, bolstered and helped that so to make sure that nothing was done by way of vigilantism. And that was important. And because uh, people could just simply get into a fight and kill one another. It was actually fairly easy. There was no DNA testing or things back then. If you killed somebody out in the middle of a field, just as Cain did Abel, um, then you're going to have a hard time even finding out who did it. People would get robbed so they couldn't be identified later, and so the victim would be executed. And that's easy to do. If you're walking from town to town and there's nobody near you, um, you can easily get mugged and, uh, and killed so that nobody can identify you later. And so there's economic reasons for why people murdered and why some of these laws were made. And others were just that people are evil in their hearts and have malice towards somebody else. Uh, it is interesting to note that, that uh, the ancient world really did not see any economic growth until very recently, until about the Renaissance. And so what that meant is that people, if they wanted to get ahead, if very few people kind of get ahead by you know, pulling up the bootstraps. You were either born in the position to which you ended up sustaining. Uh, maybe a few people could break free from that, but by and large, you were lived in the status to which you were born in, unless you were a good warrior and plunderer. And so that's what they would do is basically steal from another tribe or steal from another country in raids. That's why wars have continued uh, like endlessly throughout human history until of very late. Yes, there's conflicts, but most of those conflicts around the world today are still based on that old thinking of, I need to get these people to get their products from them. But now it is actually easier. Western nations, why, uh, you know, England and France used to fight each other all the time. Well, they found out now that economic expansion is actually easier on the pocketbook and easier on the people than it is just from stealing from one another. So the focus on growth helped them to get off that cycle of trying to get ahead by somebody else going down. The system can grow, and it has. There's far more money today in the world than there has been hundreds of years ago. And so one aspect of this, why I mentioned this, is that economics was a huge driver and still is a huge driver of um, murder. And so we want to make sure that, you know what? If people can prosper, let's try to help them to not be in a state where they think that they need to do something evil in order to just scrape by or to get ahead. Let's take away the incentive. Proverbs 31 talks about uh, the king saying, Lord, don't give me uh, poverty and don't give me riches. Because if I have poverty, I might go and steal and so shame the name of the Lord. Or if I have too much riches, I might say, who is God and, and get arrogant in heart. So I want to encourage you with that too, that this is what we can do is we can provide uh, as a family, as a church family, to make sure that our society is so just that nobody has to even think of resorting to violence uh, or robbery or anything like that or murder in order to get, uh, to get ahead in life or to even just scrape by. Further, the Old Testament prophets, particularly Jeremiah and Hosea, they talk quite frequently about um, them breaking the Ten Commandments when they're saying that they're going to lose the land of Israel, that, the, that, that they prophesied that the kingdom would collapse under the Babylonians, and they, pro and they prophesied this, but nobody believed them, saying that, no, no, we're God's people. And he would go on to list the Ten Commandments and say, you've broken all these. How do you expect that God's going to fulfill his end of the deal when we've already broken the deal? So this was an important indictment against them, and they didn't even realize uh, it until the very end. So if we read these lists of these sins that are, and we don't feel any sort of conviction or need to change, then we are just like the ancient Israelites who thought that just because they were God's people in God's country, that they were just A-OK. -okay. And when the prophets would say, look, you, you murder, you steal, you, don't, uh, you follow other gods, you don't respect your parents, you don't this and that, like that should have woken them up and saying, wow, we've broken all 10 of them pretty consistently and we don't even care. Okay, that, that should have woken them up from a spiritual slumber, and, uh, but it didn't. They went off to their destruction. So in the same way, when we read what is a sin and what isn't a sin in the New Testament, that's why the Bible is so controversial for people. Nobody likes to be pointed out where they have done wrong. I know I don't. And so the trick is people try to get defensive. They try to, um, you know, uh, just dither it away and make it say, oh, no, it doesn't really mean it like that. No, like the Bible's pretty hard hitting. And so, so what this should do is we should either receive the command and say, don't do this. Or if we recognize in our hearts that, it, it doesn't do anything good for us, meaning that our hearts don't uh, break because we've done wrong, or that our hearts get hard because we get angry because we don't like that sin that's in the Bible pointed out. 
And uh, so I'm going to go through a couple lists of, of some verses that are going to pop up on your screen. And what this is going to help us to do is, is to, like, let's do an exercise with our own heart and to see when, when one of these comes up that maybe uh, that one of us likes, um, like anger or rage. Some people just like being angry, I guess. If, if that's the case, you know, what is happening in your heart? Do you get mad that it's written in the Bible? Or are you like, oh, God, please have mercy on me, a sinner? So here's a few uh, that I hope that will help you uh, in our pursuit of understanding of these are things that God equated with murder. This is the reason why I'm mentioning these other sins right now is because they are unequivocally connected to murder. And so this is important. Holiness is not something that we just take lightly or as a second handle to our, our faith. It is something that we should drive that if our sin put Jesus on the cross and we believe in the resurrection and his purpose for our lives, then we should be horrified by our own sin and continually praying that God will make us better. And so here's a couple scriptures to help us to know that we need to take our faith journey serious. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then if we flip over to Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, it basically says the same thing the next chapter over. And it says, outside, talking about outside of heaven, outside are the dogs, those who practiced magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everybody who loves and practices falsehood. That very line of thinking has been repeated by Luke in the book of Acts. It has been repeated by uh, Peter in his epistle and James and John all the way through that those things are all connected. And this is why as we get into the behavioral side of the Ten Commandments, uh, instead of observing the Sabbath and things like that, we're now into like, what should we not do that is destructive around us? And we should find that a real joy. So what did Jesus do when it comes to murder? Well, you know what? Why don't we pull up the Word of God here and see what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You've heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anybody who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anybody who is angry with his brother is subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is inserable to the Sanhedrin. But anybody who says, you fool, will be in dangers of the fires of hell. Therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there uh, in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly so that your adversary who is taking you to court, do it while you're still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. I'm going to flip down to verse 38 as well, too. He goes, you have heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if somebody wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If somebody forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? You are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So here we learn from Jesus where he ups the bar on murder and equates anger with murder because it's something that's happened in our head and in our hearts and that just has not taken place yet. So he's very clearly saying that like, when we are angry with people, that those are murderous thoughts, and it's not long before they could actually end up happening uh, in real life. So he wants us to deal with these. He wants us to not think of revenge. He wants to think of, uh, uh, think of reconciliation. Again, relationships is what Jesus is talking about here, trying to bring the ethic into this, saying, you know what, you need to forgive your enemies. You need to not be angry. You should not be angry at someone else that God created. And even though, yes, People who are originally made perfect have sinned, and we can hate the sin, but ultimately God is the one who creates life. And it is Him and only Him that possesses all of us, and it is He that gets to decide how we operate. And so if He says, I don't want you touching what I've created, then we don't do it. And so that makes Him the boss. This is why we obey so happily, because who knows better than Him of how this operation is gonna all work out in this world. And so I want to encourage you with this today. 
that it is easy for us to get angry. It's easy for us to even get justified in our anger. You know, it's important for us to note too that, that not only are we supposed to like think of the relationship of fixing with the other person. Now I'm not talking if they're like um, doing something absolutely awful to you. You do need to rescue yourself from traumatic situations. But where possible, we should be thinking of, of A, get the anger out of our hearts. It takes the chain away. And, uh, and then finding the righteous way to deal with whatever adversary that you may have. And we should be humble about it, lest we end up being wrong, as Jesus said here, that that guy would get out of that particular dungeon, uh, not until he was paid the last penny. An extortion price is what that would be, is to, to get you to pay. Now, the next thing is this, is we learn from James chapter 1, verse 20, that anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. We also learn in Ephesians 4 that uh, we should not let the sun go down on our anger, and we should not be angered easily. Now, some people like to point out that, well, didn't Jesus even get angry? And I'm like, yep, there is a thing of called righteous anger, and you can have it. So let's look to Mark chapter 5, where it is listed. So let's see, Jesus healed somebody, uh, and God was glorified. And yes, that was when he also flipped over the tables, and because they were, uh, turned the house of God into an extortion place. And so I'll tell you this, if you can heal somebody, and if you can get everybody, the whole masses, to glorify God, you can get righteously mad at this church all you want. And, uh, but you know what? There's not miracles that happen when we get angry. We usually, what we say is righteous anger, so we try to justify our anger, saying, I'm right and they're wrong. Well, sometimes both parties are wrong, so we should be slow to get angry. Now, anger is an emotion that God gave us, so how do we properly use anger? And uh, so don't let anger take you down, live long in you, and don't let it take you down an evil path. And Jesus akins it to murder. So anger is when our justice uh, discernment gets uh, a little haywire. And it's a part of our fallen nature that we have that, but God has given us this emotion in the first place. Why? Not for us to be angry to act out at somebody else, but to give us the sense of justice and urgency and the, the energy, really. It's almost like anger should be, a righteous anger should be uh, a holy drive for us to go and fix a justice issue. And we should be wanting to fix it not by vigilantism. We should want to be fixing it through restoring of relationship. So when you get upset that you see that somebody is being persecuted, uh, you know, that's great, but don't just sit there. Uh, let's get involved with some of the helpers who are trying to fix it. To what? Restore the relationship. To help the person to get better, to get whole. If we don't like uh, something, people have a tendency to go protest when they don't like something. And, uh, and it's like, well, okay, well, what are we doing to actually fix the problem and help restore the relationship? And so let us test our anger to see what is the righteous that I can do out of this? What is the, the negative that's being tempted in me to lash out? Um, so we need to understand that, that no other person is our enemy. Only the devil is an enemy, and he's sly. He was called a murderer from the beginning. And you know what? He didn't even kill anybody until later on. But the effects of his slick tongue doomed humanity. And this is why he is known as a father of lies, and he's a father of murderers. And we need to make sure that we don't follow in his footsteps by being one of anger in murderous hearts. And we must recognize too that anger is a very potent, it's a very strong uh, emotion. It's why so many people stoke fear all the time. I wanna encourage you, what in your life is causing you anger? What is causing you to be angry with somebody else? You know what, people on the different stripes of politics, you shouldn't be angry with each other. People have different approaches to try to solve different problems, but we should try to curb our anger and to take what we see as maybe a system that is broken in this world that we think we know the proper fix is to go and say, well, ultimately we want to restore the relationship, not divide. But yet politics is often so divisive. It should be we identify a problem and we work on it together to find a solution that is best for everybody. And that is really what we, how we should develop our, our politics at home, our politics at work. That, and politics really just simply means power in relationships. And if we do have a power to be able to help, we should uh, do so. And so it can be a joy to kind of figure out what is it that is driving me, Lord, but help me to connect that with a solution that is righteous and not just be angry all the time. I know some people that, uh, you know, if you're following every injustice in the world, you're going to wear yourself out. Now, I'm not saying sit by and do nothing and just watch comedies all day. No, I'm saying understand your limits. Pay attention to when the anger is overwhelming you and taking you to a place that you don't want to go. See, this is what the Word of God is supposed to do. It is supposed to pour over us that we start to think of the ethics behind it, to think of our self-help uh, through it and our relationship with God and others. It is what the Ten Commandments all boil down to, according to Jesus, was love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. See that all these other things can be jammed into there. This is the overflow of that. And anger is not the righteous life that God wants for you. He wants you to live free. 
and he wants you to be a productive person in his kingdom. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. And most importantly, he wants you to be part of a family of Christians to continue the work that all of us are doing together on this world to make sure that the gospel that came to us doesn't stay with us. It's got to go out. It's already gone halfway around the world to get from Jerusalem to here. So let's pray what we can do together as a family to put it out uh, into the rest of the world, including our own neighborhood. So we want to always acknowledge uh, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And according to the scriptures, he was raised to life again, proving the power over sin and death. And he says that anybody who follows him and trusts him for salvation will receive it. So I encourage you today to uh, rely on the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, to trust him in that, and then to get involved with his word and get involved with his people. And let's see the old ways of things we used to do start to fall off of us and some new things that God is working on in our lives will start to shine through and we become uh, a whole again and get closer to God as that day approaches. Well, thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great day. We here at LifePoint would love to get connected with everybody who might be watching our broadcasts. And so if you are in and around the vicinity or you're watching from afar, we encourage you to get connected to us. The email here on the screen and the phone number can help us to get connected to you. You drop your information here. If you'd like to have a prayer request uh, put in, if you would like to get connected so you're on the email chain, uh, this is also a place where we can give to this email. I want to encourage you, those who are attending LifePoint, those who are Christians, that we can sow into the ministry here of LifePoint so that we can make sure that the, the gospel that came to us goes out from us. Now, we want to encourage people who have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ yet, the, don't worry about giving. This is an act of Christian worship that we get to be a part of God's amazing gift of salvation by proclaiming it to the generations yet to come. And uh, if you'd like to join up with us, we would love to get connected with you and to see what else God can do in this town and beyond in the days and years ahead. So we down here in Dartmouth at Regal have partnered with you, for those that don't know, volunteering our time and efforts to see that uh, LifePoint gets strengthened and, uh, and is able to call a new pastor for your guys' next step in your future. So I encourage you to get involved and help us to make sure that this church becomes a strong church and a beacon of light for Jesus in this community and beyond.